Test, test. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, oh, okay. uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to the second lecture of the Machine Learning Month. We're really glad to see a huge participation here. Uh, today, we have a guest lecturer, uh, Gabriel, um, and he can introduce himself. Yeah, sure. So, hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, so I'm a PhD student at the uh, Faculty of Arts, actually, here in Groningen, and I work on natural language processing. So maybe you don't know, but there is this interesting uh, division in which all the people that work on language here are in the Faculty of Arts. Even if we work with neural networks, even if we do very technical stuff, we're still there. Um, so, and I'm also the co-teacher of the natural language processing master course that some students from the AI program, I think, take during their studies. So today I will just uh, cover some material that I think is very interesting as a simple introduction to the topic, okay? Um, Maybe I would like to start with a couple of questions because I really don't know who you are. <laughs> so I would really like to understand, first of all, whether you already have some knowledge in machine learning in general. Wait, okay. In machine learning in general, in NLP, if you already use some of the libraries we're going to use. So maybe I can ask you questions and you can raise the hand, okay, if you did these things. So. Do you, I think you were there also last week, so some of you had an introduction to machine learning techniques in general, right? Raise your hands, everyone. Some of you, okay, good. Uh, so have you worked on mostly on tabular data? Who works just with tabular data? Like not images, not language, okay. And are you mostly like bachelor students? Is there someone from the masters? Master students? No, okay, that's good. Um, all right, so this is gonna be a more introductory lecture to the topic. Did everyone manage to reach the Colab notebook? Yeah? At this link. So the idea is that you visit this link. Uh, it's going to lead you to a Colab notebook. Who's not familiar with Colab notebooks? Raise your hands. OK. Are you familiar with Jupyter to run Python code? Are you familiar with Python code? <laughs> OK. All right. Um, so just think of these notebooks as a way to run uh, code interactively in your browser, okay? So basically, we're just going to run Python code in your browser to see some things. Uh, if you visit this link, it's going to bring you to uh, the notebook. You can open it, and then it's important that you create a local copy in your drive because this will allow you to edit the notebook. If you just run mine, you cannot touch it, okay, because it's my notebook. Good? So as you can see, this is going to be more of a tutorial. Like I, I'm not really giving a lecture here. I'm going to like show you some things, mostly from a, an applied perspective. Okay. Did everyone get the link? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you all manage? Good. 
So as you can see, I'm running this first cell in the notebook. What this does is just to install the dependencies, so the libraries that we're gonna use for this tutorial, okay? Um, so you can just run it and it's gonna do everything it needs. Um, let's talk a bit about these libraries that we're gonna use today. So you said no one here worked with language any before this tutorial, or did someone? Yeah. All right, so maybe you worked with some tools like Spacey probably or something like this. So the, the libraries that we're gonna see today, there's gonna be two sets. There's gonna be the more basic machine learning and NLP libraries like scikit-learn, which maybe you already know, pandas for data managing, and Spacey, which is specific to NLP. And this is gonna be the first part of the tutorial. The second part, we're gonna have a very quick look to the Transformers library, which is a very recent library that is nowadays used a lot in the industry for advanced NLP applications, okay? So here, my command run. Um, so yeah, to start, um, in, this, in this first step of our, of our tutorial, we're gonna do a very simple um, machine learning pipeline to predict the quality of a wine, okay? So we have a data set taken from Kaggle, actually, um, that contains a lot of wine reviews alongside other fields, okay? Um, and the interesting part is that we have, for example, the country, the province from where the wine was produced, uh, the type of wine, and the price, okay? And then we have these ratings that are the review, basically, the points that were given to the wine in terms of quality. And you can think that these points may depend on a lot of factors, right? So they can depend, for example, on the price of the wine. If it's a okay-ish wine, but it's very cheap, then probably it will get good points, right? Because it's cheap. Uh, but so you can think that there's gonna be some fields, some numerical fields that are useful to predict this score, but we also have textual reviews, okay? And these textual reviews usually contain a lot of information because maybe the person that gave the points say that the price is good, but the quality not so much, you know? And from this, you can get something about the, the point that the reviewer is gonna give to the wine, okay? So in this pipeline, what we're interested in is to try to combine these numerical features with textual features to try to predict this course. Someone here have heard of this uh, name regression problem? Yes, in your courses? So someone can tell me what is a regression problem? Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's the key, right? So you predict a, a value that is not a, a class. It's not a label, but it's a floating point value, basically. Um, okay, so let's start by um, having a look at the data. And I also wanted to mention the fact that what we're seeing today is focused on regression, I said, but you can probably use most of the things for classification too. You just have to change, for example, instead of uh, the linear regression, you're gonna use a logistic regression and it's just gonna work for classification, okay? Okay, so now I'm gonna run this cell and this is gonna load the data that we have and convert it to pandas format, which is something that I think you're most familiar with, okay? <clears throat> Coming up, okay. So you can see that this is what we mentioned before, right? <clears throat> the country, the description of the wine, the points, which are the label, okay? This is what we want to predict. 
the price, the, the province, and the variety, the type of wine. Okay. Um, do you have an idea in general what could be problematic when you use textual features to predict um, a score? So I give you a text and I tell you, based on this text, create features to predict a score. Yeah. Yes, this, this of course is very important. But also, let's say, normally, for example, you have a linear uh, regression model, okay? You have your five features, I don't know, the, the price, the province, which is a number, you know, a, a class. And the model is always going to receive these five features and it's going to always predict the output, okay? With text, what comes to mind that could be problematic in this setting, in your opinion? Yeah, this, of course, is a big problem. And then do you mean uh, when you predict, uh, you also have to make descriptions? Like, uh, um, no, not necessarily. But I mean, if you have a description, yeah, maybe I can. Uh, what, sorry? Yeah, the order matters a lot. So this is already a property that is different from other features, right? The context, the context yeah. But also just the length, right? <clears throat> you have a paragraph that can be 10 words or can be 100. And normally a model takes a fixed amount of features, right, to predict a label. So how do you handle this, right? OK. So this is the motivation why we need preprocessing on language. So you're going to see later that more modern approaches don't actually do what we're going to do right now, because you lose a lot of information by doing what we're doing. But this is the most standard way of doing things, OK? So you may know what is a lemma. Does someone that have a <laughs> linguistic background knows what a lemma is? No, lemma not. No, 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 it's not. Let's. No. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course, you're talking about mathematics, right? Of course, yeah, it, it is a fundamental theory and it is a ground truth. But in linguistics, what is a lemma? OK. No, OK. In linguistics, a lemma of a word is its base function, basically. So like its base form. So if you have uh, like going, OK, the verb going, the lemma of going is go which is the base form without the, let's say, the conjugation of the verb to the specific context, you know. So this is already something that is very useful, right? If I'm able to convert all the words in their lemmas, this already reduces the variability of my text, OK? So if I have a text that have the whole vocabulary of English as possibilities, let's say 100,000 words, OK? This means that if I wanted to represent every word as a fixed size feature, it would be a vector in which there is one one and nine 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 zeros. Okay, to say this is the word that I want. I'm not sure that it's clear. Yeah. We say which one it, it is. Yeah, exactly. But this would generate huge vectors that are extremely sparse, which is something totally useless for us, OK? Because it's, it's not manageable, and the information is so scattered around that it's basically the same as looking at the text as if it was a sequence of bits, OK? Let me just drink a bit. So. The idea of reducing this vocabulary size could be, for example, using a lemmatizer. Um, and conveniently, there are a lot of these informations that are already pre-packaged into some packages, for example, Spacey. Okay. So what we're going to see here is uh, a way to clean up a bit our text. So Spacey comes with pre-trained um, uh, pipelines, they call them, which contain a lot of linguistic information. 
<clears throat> for example, here at the beginning, we downloaded the English one here. OK. Um, yeah. There's a more efficient way. Uh, yeah, we're going to have a look now. But first, we're going to try to reduce the variability in text, and then we're going to have a look at, of how to represent it, OK? So what we can do here is to load the pipeline, OK? Just ignore the disabled part. We don't really care right now, OK? Um, and now we define our function. Our function is going to be clean text which takes a text in input, so a string. And here you see a sequence of tags that maybe tell you something, or maybe not. Does someone know what these are? Yes. What? Yes. Parts of speech? Yes. What are parts of speech? Well, classes of words yes. that are yeah, describing the function. Yes, that's very good. So exactly. So in Spacey, we have by default that the, the pipeline can extract this information from the sequence, OK? So what we can do, for example, is to select a set of part of speeches that we consider to be what we call in linguistic content words, so words that usually bear some you know, information beside, the, for example, end, end in itself. You know, it's not very informative. It can be very useful for specific tasks. But in our context, maybe it's not really informative, OK? So we don't want to keep it. But for example, nouns, verb, adjectives, uh, adverbs, and proper nouns are all very useful, OK? So what we're, seeing, what we're saying here is we're going to take a subset of these words only if the post tag of the word is among the tags that we specify here. And we're not going to take the word itself, but we're going to take the lemma, OK? So let's try to run this thing. Hopefully. All right. So. The output that I, the input that I gave is this is a test sentence and here comes another one, go me. And this is the output, OK? So of course, if you try to understand this output in terms of what did it mean originally, in terms of language because you're a human, the information is not there anymore, OK? But if one of these words was bad, for example, or worse, that gets converted to bad because it's the lemma, OK? If I'm a system that receives this as an input, it might be likely that the review is negative, OK? So I reduced a lot the variability of the sentence while extracting only salient information. So you can think that the vocabulary that we could build after this preprocessing is quite smaller than the original vocabulary, OK? So now let's apply this cleaning step to our data set. And in the meantime, let's talk about <clears throat> a more meaningful way to represent text than just ones and zeros, OK? So now we compacted a bit this representation. But there's, we can leverage some additional information about this text, OK? So a typical approach is to use this TFIDF vectorizer, OK? So what is TFIDF? I would like you to try to read these lines that I wrote down and that someone tries to explain it to me, OK? No rush.
Is there some volunteer? Yes. Yes. In the end, it's gonna yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we have a collection of data in principle to co compute this score. But so, why do you think having both the term frequency and the inverse document frequency is useful in this context then? Yes? Right, and so by considering the document also, so by considering something that occurs a lot, but very sporadically, okay? So for example, we know that this word occurs a lot of times in this document, but not much in the others. This tells us something about this document, okay? If it was occurring a lot in general, like and or the, maybe it doesn't mean much, okay? So the, the document factor would remove these words that are very frequent, but are also very frequent across documents, okay? So this gives us information related to what, what, what words characterize every document, okay? So, and this computes a score, and this score is more meaningful than a one or a zero, because it's a score of the word in the document, okay? Yes? And based on that, we decide uh, from what score language per se we would uh, not consider some uh, words? For example, yes. For example, this could be, you're going to see here what we do. So here, there is a TF-IDF vectorizer in scikit-learn, so very convenient. And it also accepts parameters, okay? So what we're saying here, you can see that I specify <clears throat> use one grams and two grams. Do you know what grams are? So these are basically what you consider a word, okay? So imagine that you have a text, you separate words with white space as a simplification. A two gram would be all the combinations of contiguous couples of words, okay? So by doing this, we also have a more coarse representation of the text. So we have textual pairs, okay? And then we're also saying ignore terms that are either too rare or too frequent. Remove stop words, which are, for example, and, or, okay? These words that we know that we don't want. And take only the top 50 features, okay? So what I'm saying now is I just want the top features that obtain the highest scores for this, so the most characteristic ones, okay? So if I run this, what I'm doing, I don't know if you're confident, like, confident enough with like, scikit-learn, but I, how many know how fit transform works in scikit-learn? Okay, it's a very simple idea. You have two operations, fit, that takes a model and fits it on the data, okay? So it's what you call training a model. And then transform is basically applying the prediction, okay? So here I'm predicting and generating the vectorized version of this data. So now the model was trained. And if I look at, for example, acidity here, it's the zeroth vector in this feature table, okay? 
So now let's have a look at this feature table. <clears throat> so this feature table is still sparse, OK? Because this is the number of texts, 10,000, OK? The number of rows. And then we have 50, which is the number of, number of words that we asked the model to keep, OK? And you can see that these are the most salient words that you can see here, OK? So for every text, instead of having just a 1 for all the words that are contained in the text and a 0 for those that are not, you have a score for every word that tells you how important is that word in that specific text, OK? Is someone familiar with the issue of converting categorical data to one-hot representation? Have someone heard of one-hot? Sounds a bit weird. Yeah. Yeah. And then you convert it into a vector of n dimensions where you only, yeah, there's a vector of zeros and you set the one entry to one where well, your uh, map in categorical values. Yes, that's right. But a bit more complicated. Why? Yeah, maybe. Okay. Yeah. And then you can set for if a person's got blue eyes, you set blue, blue well, eyes. Yeah. And then others to zero, so you know they have blue eyes. So probably if you saw it last week, you also saw why this is preferable as having a category that is one, two, three, for example, right? Does someone know? Yes. Better what? Mm -hmm. Let's see if there's a clearer. Uh, it's on the right path, but it's, I want to hear it more clearly. Yeah. It's, there is no uh, categorical data, and normally does not have a linear relationship. Yes, that's the point. Yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly the point. So if you have a, for example, I here if you have a, the country, here. Uh, sorry, the province. And you have California, New York, Champagne, Bordeaux, OK? And I represent this as 1, 2, 3, 4, for example, in a single column, OK, in a single feature. My model is going to learn that 1 is closer to 2, OK, than it is closer to 3, which is not true for categorical data because California is not more related to Champagne than to New York, OK? There's no such relation among classes. That's why you have to represent them as separate feature, OK? So what we do here is that we simply use these pandas get dummies to convert our, our uh, categorical columns into one hot features, OK? So this PD get dummies does exactly what we just said, OK? It just turns it into zeros and one. You see that now every column has the name of the value, and the one is where the matching um, field is, basically. So now that we have represented all categorical features like this, and that we have a numerical representation of text here, what we can do is to start fitting a model, OK? Is everyone fine with this? Like, did you understood the logical reasoning behind this? All right. So what we do is to combine these numerical values into a single huge vector, OK? So we have 10,000 times 50 here. And we have, for example, 10,000 times 8 here. We just 
concatenate all these vectors, okay? And then we fit a simple linear regression on it, okay? Voila, it's already done. <laughs> so it's quite quick. <clears throat> so to understand whether what we did was meaningful or not, you could use a baseline, okay? So I'm sure that you heard about baselines in your machine learning courses or whatever you had related to machine learning. So uh, I would like to hear what are baselines useful for. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, what would you use as a baseline, for example? Um, no. So, if it matches your data exactly, it would be perfect. Okay. The baseline would be, be like 100 accuracy, and this doesn't tell you anything. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. If you're worse than that, then it's invalid. Yeah, I agree. Like, so in this case, for example, we use the mean. So for regression problems, you use this kind of mean, for example, or you can use other statistics. You can use the mode or the median, for example. And um, if we're talking about classification, you might want, for example, to take the most frequent class, OK? So you always predict the most frequent class, which of course is going to be, let's say, the maximum that you can achieve by shooting blindly just one result, and then you see whether your model is better than that. <clears throat> so we fit the baseline. Good. For now, we don't have scores yet, OK? Now that we fit our baseline and our model, we need to evaluate them. OK? So how do you evaluate regression? So you have a regression, you're fitting a line in an n-dimensional space where the dimension represents the number of features that you're using. And you have, let's say, a true line that is represented by your data points, OK? Well, true line, let's say empirically observe the true line, OK? How do you evaluate whether your predictions are good or not in this context? So we're talking about regression here. Yes? Yeah, so what, what, what is the error in this, in this context? Yeah, and yeah, is there? a problem with taking the difference between two points in space. Like, let's say one time I, I predict plus 10, one time I predict minus 10. Yeah, and that's why we square it. Right? right, that's a good point, yeah. So if I was just taking the difference, if I was overshooting once, undershooting the second time, I take the average is zero, so my model is perfect, okay? So the reason of why either we square it or we take the absolute value of the error is because of this, OK? And um, yeah, I like to take both. So both mean square error, which is the squared one, and the mean absolute error, which is in absolute value. And while the mean square error is more used, why I like to use the mean absolute error is that it gives you an idea in the actual unit of the prediction of how wrong you are, and not in the squared unit, OK? So let's try this. Now I'm loading the test portion of the data set. OK. Pretty much the same as we would expect it to be. <clears throat> and once again, scikit-learn defines these metrics for us. So what I'm doing here is to retransform the test set following the same procedure that we saw right now. So the training set and the test set must follow the same preprocessing. Otherwise, 
the prediction are, are not going to make sense. Okay, your features have to be on the same space. So the, the crucial point here, the crucial uh, point that you don't have to get wrong is that when you apply the vectorizer to get the TFIDF here, you have to transform only, okay? The vectorizer was already fit on the training, so you don't fit in on the testing at this point, okay? You just transform your test data with the TFIDF that you learned from your training, okay? Otherwise, it would just break. It wouldn't even work, so. All right. Um, yeah, so let's try this. Okay. And now let's try to print the metrics. So I just feed the predictions of the model, so regressor prediction and baseline prediction and I compare them with the actual test target, okay? Okay. And we can see here that we got a little bit better with linear regression, but it's not great still, okay? Well, it depends on how you quantify being great. So this tells me that we're on average two points off of the actual value that was given to the y. It's not that bad, given that it's on a scale to 0 to 100, let's say. But is it actually not that bad? So now we're going to try to understand whether it's actually not that bad or not, OK? To do this, the only way, or I would say the best way, probably, is to actually see the data, OK? <laughs> to understand what we're working with. So in pandas, it's actually very easy to visualize data using the histogram function. <clears throat> so what we're plotting here is first the, the labels, so the, the scores that we wanted to predict for the training set, this DF. And then we plot them for the test set, OK? And we can see that there is a very weird gap in the test set on this specific value. Do you have an idea why, maybe? I have an hypothesis, but of course it's just an hypothesis. Yes? Oh, no, we, we didn't do it on purpose. Like, it, it's totally accidental. Yeah, the, the, the gap is there. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, good guess, but yeah, no, it's... Uh, <laughs> My guess is that the people that scored the wines didn't want to give 87.5 to a wine. They wanted to give either 85 or 90, which sounds nicer, right, when you're scoring a wine. But I mean, it's a guess, OK. Um, but so you can see that we're two, yeah? Why is it in our training data then, then, and not in Yeah, that's a good question. That, that's the actual question, actually. But, so maybe my assumption is wrong, OK? But, Mm, it was already, this, this data was on Kaggle, and it was already split in training and testing, so. Okay. Yeah, but it's a, it's a good point. Use, uh, but there's no randomness here. Split. Split. I, I'm not split, it was already pre-split in training and testing, so there's no, uh, there's no randomness here. So. Well, we observed that this is the property of our data, uh, but the most important thing that I wanted you to notice is that we know that the values in this scale were up to 100, right? But actually, we can see that the lowest score here is 80, okay? And that most of the values are between 87 and 92, okay? So getting two points of distance is maybe not that good, actually. Even if our scale is huge, if the, all the values are squeezed into a very thin, thin interval, maybe the model is not great, OK? So this is just a reflection for you. <laughs> Always look at your data, OK? Um, I also want to look at the prediction of the model. And I have to say that 
Yeah, I mean, even if the error is on average around two points, the prediction are, you know, what I would expect from this model, actually. They seem to follow quite nicely the training distribu distribution, actually. Of course, you lose the extremes because the model is not going to be incentivized to predict 100 if it's so unlikely, OK? Everything clear for now? Good. And yeah, this was just a sanity check. We also want to see the baseline prediction. We said that the baseline is just the mean. So all the predictions are the mean of the values, OK? You see 1,000 predictions of the mean. <clears throat> oh, OK, yeah. And I was visualizing also the difference between the prediction of the model and the, the test target. And we can see that most errors are actually below one, OK, in scores. But the average is still two, OK? So this is the distribution that I would expect, actually, from, let's say, a normal fit and model. So let's recap what we did until now. Now this concludes the first part of this tutorial, which was the kind of NLP that you see in classrooms that is useful to get under, an understanding of what NLP is, of how you work with linguistic data, but it's not actually what we do anymore, okay? Like, ever, ever. But it's still useful to have a look, okay? So we extracted lemmatize content words, so only the post tags that we wanted to have. We converted them into a vector representation that wasn't just ones and zeros, but also consider the frequency of the terms. We converted categorical features into one-hot vectors. We concatenate those. We fit a model. We fit a baseline. And we compare the two, OK? This is what you're going to do in 10 years if you work as a machine learning engineer, just a bit more complicated, OK? <laughs> Like, the, the, the process is always the same, let's say. All right, so let's pass to the most interesting part of the tutorial, which is working with more modern tools. Does someone have a question on the previous part before I move forward? No, OK. So how many of you know about anything by Hugging Face. So Hugging Face Transformers, Hugging Face Datasets, Hugging Face Hub, one, two, three, four. All the others. If I say Hugging Face, you think about the emoji? OK, good. So it's actually a company. It's actually a company. Um, <clears throat> we're actually going to have a look at the website first. So I'm not promoting a company, actually. It's just, <laughs> it's just that it's, uh, they made a lot of tools for, for machine learning pe people, let's say, that are open source and very, very used these days. So I, for example, I can bring you my, my own experience where more or less 30 people working on NLP at the Faculty of Arts. And most of us use this library daily for their work, OK? So, so basically, what they have here is a hub, OK? They call it a hub, which is a collection of different things. So first of all, they have a, a collection of models, OK? So you can see here a very large number, which is 91,000 models. All these are publicly available and easily downloadable, OK? So basically, the idea is that they wanted to create an open source, easily usable platform for different tasks, OK? They started with natural language processing, and that's why most of us use it. But right now, actually, they're working a lot on computer vision. So, and they support a whole lot of frameworks. You can see here there are some libraries. There's PyTorch, TensorFlow, and JAX, 
which I would say are the three most popular if you consider that Keras is inside TensorFlow, okay? Um, so you can see that these are all models. Does someone, he, like, have you ever heard about GPT-2? Yes, probably, right? Even if you never work on machine learning, probably you did. So GPT-2 is a model by OpenAI uh, that is trained to predict text, basically. So it's what we call a language model. And how this works is very simple. It's a model that generates text word by word. So you can imagine it as a time series, in a sense. And at time t, you take into account all the previous context, and you predict the next token from a vocabulary. Okay. Then this token is added to the previous context, and you use it for predicting the one that comes after. Okay. And you repeat this process. What's the power behind this model is that it's not simply, let's say, a dry model architecture untrained, but it was trained on trillions of documents. Okay. So you can imagine that it's the equivalent of a person reading trillions of documents and having to predict the next word given the previous ones, okay? I think if you all are given a sentence like, welcome back, ladies, and, you can give me with a quite good confidence the next word at this point. And the way that you do it is because you have an idea of what co-occurs with these words that I just said, okay? So what we call statistical language modeling is simply to understand properties about language from the co-occurrences of words, okay? So this also answers the questions that we had before uh, that was, is the most the best way of representing text actually just along vectors of zeros with a one or a TF-IDF score here and there? Actually, no, okay? So this is not something that is used anymore. And what we actually do is to learn dense representations of meaning from co-occurrences of text. Can you explain to me what I just said? What does it mean, dense, first of all? Dense representation, yeah. So, uh, dense is like as much information possible into the smallest amount of space, or a vector, for example? Yes, exactly. So the idea is that, well, before we had, for example, 10,000 values, one per vocabulary word. Now we might want to compress this information. What's a, maybe you have an idea of a way to compress this information, or you don't? Yes, that's, a, that's actually how the first ever, let's say, approach creating this dense representation worked. You just had a neural network that had to predict the next word, but to predict the next word, this neural network had feedforward layers. Are you familiar with this? Feedforward layers in neural networks? Okay. Um, so th let's say this neural network had to transform some input features into a structured representation that would allow it to predict the next word, okay? Then you just disregard the fact that the network is predicting the next word, and what you actually care about is that this word that the neural network is able to predict is represented with the dense representation that the network used to predict it, okay? So you, once upon a time, we used these dense representations for every word in the vocabulary to predict, to, to do all our tasks. And what's the big advantage of this is that instead of having, 
for example, 100,000 dimensions, mostly empty, you would have maybe 300, mostly valued, okay? Is it clear? Yes, maybe, okay. So you can see we were talking about GPT-2. So this model is a transformer model, which is a, an advanced architecture of a neural network, uh, which probably I won't go much into detail today because, I mean, it's a quite advanced topic. If you're interested, take our class during your master's. Um, but uh, so the idea here is that this neural network predicts the next word. And you can see here that this text, for example, is generated by the neural network. So the blue part here <clears throat> was generated by the neural network given the black part, okay? Maybe it doesn't mean anything, but it sounds like human text to me, okay? It sounds meaningful, okay? So for example, and I'm teaching, whoa, <laughs> I'm teaching, okay? And yeah, for example, you know, I'm not teaching at a Catholic seminar, but I'm still teaching, okay? And this would be a description that you maybe saw in a book, okay? Um, so the interesting, what's, what's the most interesting thing here? So you might say, why do we care about models that generate random text that doesn't make any sense as now, okay? So the, the interesting part is that while learning to generate it, they learn to represent it, okay? So to be able to generate that after I am teaching, there, there needs to be a, at the something, for example, to make it you know, fluent in, in English, the model must know what, in a sense, what is expected to come next. And to know what comes next, you have to know the context, okay? So the interesting thing is that these models can be taken as they are and just recycled for other tasks, okay? So now we're gonna have a look at a very high level way of using this library, which is called transformers, because it's mostly transformer-based models, um, that basically you can use in this way, even if you know nothing about these models, okay? It's a completely black box usage of the library, okay? So the interesting thing to enable this black box usage, they define this class called pipeline, okay? You can use these pipelines simply by specifying a task and specifying a model from their hub, okay? <clears throat> So let's try to run this. <clears throat> First of all, you can see that there's an interesting point is that this model is quite big, let's say. For machine learning standards, if you're used to scikit-learn, for example, now what it did is just downloaded half a gigabyte okay, of a model checkpoint. So, of course, this is something to be mindful about, okay? Like, you're using something that is very powerful for your task, but most of the time, these models are also very large. For example, we can have a look at this model that I, um, that I loaded just now so that we can understand what it does. So to have a look, I simply go to the hugging face uh, hub, so let's say go to the model section, and then paste the name here, okay? So this name, that is what we passed to the pipeline, is the model identifier, okay? So if I click on the model, it tells me interesting things. For example, 292,000 people downloaded this model last month, 
which is a lot. <laughs> um, and it also tells you some details, OK? So for example, this is telling me that it's a Roberta model. This is a type of architecture trained on 124 million tweets, OK? And these tweets were collected between January and December, January 2018 and December 2021. OK, it even tells me how to use it, OK? So I, can, I could just copy this, OK? And I can even try it here, OK? So COVID cases are increasing fast. It already tells me negative. But what if I say slowly, for example? Still negative. <laughs> so it, it doesn't look very nice. Let's see if it's tricked by. Did you see that the difference between exclamation mark and not exclamation mark? So we see that the model maybe seems like that it's biased by having exclamation marks as to something that is positive. OK. Yeah, exactly. So maybe the fact that it's negatively associated, it's even overriding. Yeah, but so for example, let's say are decreasing. OK, now it's not uh, <laughs> by default, so it needs to load the model. coming. No, no, it, it, it always works. You can write a garble. It, it's always going to predict something. OK, so COVID cases are decreasing. It's predicted as neutral. OK. But so let's say tomorrow is my birthday. It's not true, but that's positive. OK. But no one is coming. Negative. OK. That's interesting. OK, so yeah, the example that I had here is classifying. I've been waiting for this lecture for my whole life, positive 76%. And what about if I say, I've been waiting for this lecture to end for my whole life? Negative, OK? So you can see that basically this is a bit more advanced than what we were seeing before. It's able to contextualize, OK? The fact that you know, it's saying waiting, for example, which might have a positive connotation, it doesn't take it blindly, but it weights it on the context of the sentence, OK? Does someone have questions for this? All right. So this was an example of text classification, OK? So we have three categories, negative, neutral, positive, And we want to predict which one it is. Let's see what else can we do with this, OK? <clears throat> so for example, um, what I was interested in was to do translation. So my research as a PhD student is in machine translation, OK? So this is something that I use quite a lot. So you can take, for example, this text-to-text -text generation uh, pipeline. And let's have a look at what this model does, OK? So the information here, it's a bit uh, cryptic. It says source language FR. Target language EN, dataset opus. So this is a bit uh, like uninformative, OK? But what this is, is it's a transformer-based translation model that translates always from French to English, OK? So if I have to use it, 
I can download it first, <clears throat> and then I can try to generate. So you can see that this model is a bit smaller than the other one. Bye-bye. And that what it does is, instead of predicting a single label, what it's predicting is actually the translation of the sentence. So we started from ce laboratoire a été adapté à partir du cours créé par Hugging Face, and it becomes this laboratory was adapted from the course created by Hugging Face, okay? Um, yeah, so this is another approach. We also have question answering, okay? Are you familiar with question answering? No. <laughs> yes? I would guess uh, you give it a question if it gives an answer back. Yeah, so let, let's reason about this a bit because, so how would you teach a machine to give an answer, okay? Right, so this, this is what we call um, abstractive question answering, okay? So if I give a, a question to my model, and the model needs to gener come up with an answer by its own knowledge, okay? What we're doing here, actually, is what we call extractive question answering, which instead means I want the model to, given a question and a context, to extract the part of the context that contains the answer, okay? So this is the question answering that we're doing here. So once again, we wait for the models to load and to run. So you can see which percentage of the Amazon rainforest is found in Colombia, and then we provide the model with this paragraph, and the model is going to give a high probability, 96%, that the answer is 10%. So it starts at character 653, and it ends at character 656 in the paragraph, okay? Which is indeed the percentage that Colombia has. What if I said Peru, without reloading the model maybe? Wait. Yeah, so now we get 13%, okay? So the model is able to extract the information that we would like to from the text. So in a sense, it's able to understand that this information is contained there and where it is. How does this work in practice, okay? So let's have a look a bit beyond the abstraction here. You provide the model with a raw text, which is what you gave the model as input. Then what happens? The, to each one of these models, there is a tokenizer that is associated to the model. What this tokenizer does is simply to convert a string of text into a string of IDs. These IDs represent words in a vocabulary. Okay? How are these defined? Normally, these tokenizers are learned, okay? So they're not um, that someone creates a vocabulary. You can do it, but usually what you do is you have a very large corpus of text. You feed it to the tokenizer, and the tokenizer learns what's the most likely pieces of words, okay? So this sentence gets tokenized like this, Interestingly, you see that there are seven IDs while the words in the sentence are four, right? Does someone have an idea for that? Every what, sorry? No, actually no. But it's a, it's a good guess, yeah. In a sense, it's related, yes. Someone else? I'm going to try to give you a hint, is 
splitting on the space the only way of creating a vocabulary? What I said just before was this vocabulary, usually it's not written down by someone, but it's learned. This could also be an idea, yeah, of course. But actually here is that the splitting is learned, OK? So we're not dividing this sentence into words, clear words. But the length of tokens is learned. So for example, I'm going um, gonna to give you a very concrete example of why you would like to have this, OK? So imagine that. There is a word, for example, here you have amazing, OK? So you have this word has a root that is amaze, OK? So you have the verb amaze, you have amazing, you have amazement, which is a noun. All these contain amaze, OK? This amaze means something in itself, because all these things are related, right? But if you were to consider them separate words, the model wouldn't know that they are related. So the idea is to learn that amaze means something in itself. So in this context, for example, amazing is going to be split into amaze-ing. Okay? So once that we have these input IDs, we feed them through the model, which we're just going to imagine that it's a black box here. And what we get out is some scores, log, log values of, pre, of probabilities that represent our predictions. So in this case, there were just two instead of three, as we saw before. Then, yes? In the example you gave with amazing, how would it be uh, ink? For what purpose? Yeah, well, ink conveys some information, right? Having ink in itself. So oh, yeah, so let's say to, it's a bit hard to not go in too much into details with that, okay? But let's say in general, every word, so amaze and ing, are gonna have their own representation, okay? Which is learned from large context of text. This is a starting representation, and then the moment that the model predicts something, this starting representation is fed through the model, and contextualized for the sentence, OK? So by itself, the vector that represents a maze is not going to know that it's going to be followed by ing until it goes through the model. But once it does, the model takes care of combining this information. Like a filter and a mixer, I would say. Like the idea of why they're called transformers is really that the shape of the vectors is preserved, but the information is mixed. So you're going to take out the same vectors, the same dimension, but the information inside each vector is going to be an information that is a kind of like a summary of the sentence, OK? OK. So this was a very quick overview of this, of the library, also of the tool. So I really would suggest you to have a look at this because it's very interesting. You have a ton of things. Also, maybe you don't want to know anything about the transformers library, but you have a ton of data sets, like 14,000 data sets here that you could use for all sort of things, OK? So this is interesting. <clears throat> and to conclude the lecture, I would like to just have a very quick example of how you could use different models as building blocks with this library to do something quite complex, OK? So in this library, what we're going to do now is to build a system that, given an image, is able to answer questions um, about the image. But I would like it to have in Italian, because I'm Italian, so. I would like it to speak my language, OK? And maybe there's not going to be a, a pre-trained model that is able to answer questions and that was trained on Italian, OK? 
but by leveraging translation systems plus a system that has English, maybe we're going to be able to do it, OK? So, and you can see how quick this is, because this is a quite complex use case, right? We're predicting answers from an image, but also in a language that is not the original one of the model. You can see that this can be achieved basically in like 10 lines of code, more or less, OK? So what we do here is we define first a visual question answering model, second, a translation model from Italian to English, and third, a translation model from English to Italian, OK? And then what we do in the function is very simple. We take a question in Italian and the image URL that we want the model to, you know, to analyze to answer the question. Then we're just going to take very logical steps, which are converting the question into English, asking the question to the model, converting the answer to Italian. OK? So let's define the function and the URLs of these two images that you can see here, which are quite interesting. Loading. a bit long. <laughs> it's quite, I mean, it's three models that need to be downloaded, OK? So it's almost done. And so now I define my images, I define my function, and what I want to do is this simple, for example, cosa è raffigurato nell'immagine? What is represented in the image? And I feed the Doug cushion image. Un cane, a dog, OK? Di che colore è la sciarpa del cane? What's the color of the scarf of the dog? Rosso, red, OK? So for now, <laughs> you, you might argue that maybe it should have said a cushion, right, actually, rather than a dog. But this is the kind of question that maybe a person would also answer a dog, right? So, And then we can keep going, basically. Di che colore è lo sfondo del disegno? What's the color of the background of the painting? Brown, marrone, OK? So I hope that these very basic, simple examples gave you a very brief overview of what can be achieved nowadays. All these things are entirely open source, usable from Colab, from the web browser, OK? So I would say that nowadays, really, these kind of technologies are available for everybody. And yeah, I think you're all in AI, so I'm sure you're <laughs> You're gonna. You're not all in AI. There's someone in computer science. Yeah. Okay. Well, well. You, you're probably if you're here now, probably you're wanna. You're gonna wanna explore also in these kind of fields. So, I hope you're gonna. You're gonna be interested about this. Um, yeah, I think this concludes it for me. Of course, I'm here if you have questions or like if you want to know more. I'm also here to speak about my life as a PhD, of course, if, you, if someone wants to know uh, what it feels like, it's, I'm here, OK? Have a good night. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, the link, the link, sorry. sorry. <laughs> you send it to me. Yep, sorry, sorry. There was something more.
there is a link that Good luck copying that. Okay, yeah. take that. Uh, we'll to give you a oh, thanks. thanks. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. It was a pleasure, and like, I think everybody enjoyed it. Thanks. Um, Do you want to talk about the link? Yes. Uh, before we conclude and everybody leaves, you wanna, we'll share the link on Discord or on Kaggle or both, so that you could please, uh, could you please fill in the questionnaire so that we know your feedback, how, how was the lecture, and in general, like, what did you like? and like how we could improve it in the future. Um, thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions for Gabrielle, uh, you can stay and uh, yeah. Thank you.